pulling into the winter pasture here, I first want to go check the hot wire that I put up the other day, but then I also need to pick up the hay wagon. I brought a bale out for the cows the other day just because I thought the feed was getting a little bit short and they have demolished the bale as I would expect. So we gotta run the feed wagon back home, get it loaded up so we can bring it out again tomorrow. They got the majority of that mowed down, which is really not a surprise, but usually, last year at least, they would leave a lot underneath the trailer, and then when I would pull the trailer out of here, they had a little bit for the next day, but it looks like they have gotten very skilled at reaching under there and getting the rest of that, because there's really not too much under there this time. Back here at the ranch now and I guess I haven't really officially started the video yet I need to take a bale over to the steer pasture today and then ask for what comes after that I'm not entirely sure it's gonna depend on how much time we've got but it'll be something that's what's going on today on farmer Tyler ranch We got this bale loaded in the feed wagon for tomorrow. It'll go back over to the winter pasture, but for tonight, I'm gonna park this in the barn so that if it does rain, which I think it's supposed to, this'll stay dry. I really don't have to tie this down because it can't roll forward and backward and it can only roll a limited way side to side. But what I learned is that while driving, if it's not tied down, every time you go around a corner or anything, the bale rolls over and hits the side of the truck and makes the whole truck kind of twitch on you. So it's not a huge deal, but it is a little bit annoying while you're driving. So I'm just tying it down. Callie, I don't think the cats like you. I know you like them. There you go, kids. I've had it. To the steer pasture we go. Pulling in at the steer pasture over here, and I'm trying to spot these guys, see where they're at. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Always feels good when everybody's still here. Two. 
Well, they seem pretty happy with that. And yes, I should have moved the feeder to a spot that's not quite so muddy, but I, I didn't really think this through. In order to do that, I would have had to set the bale down, and if I did that, then they just would have started tearing into it. It would have been a mess, so. I'll move it next time. A few more days, we'll be out here with another bale. The first harvest date for these guys is around the middle, later part of March. So that means these guys got two more months to go. But man, looking at a couple of these boys, I think they're about ready to go right now. Well, I guess better too big than too small, right? We've been having some problems with cows jumping over this cattle guard. It's really not long enough. They can fairly easily jump over it and they know it now. So we've had to start putting this gate up to, to block it off so that they don't escape. This is a little bit inconvenient now because I've got to pull this thing down every time I drive through, but it's not as inconvenient as having to catch cows when they get out. I am exploring some other options uh, besides using a cattle guard there. I mean, obviously we would continue to use the cattle guard, but we might try to add some sort of a drive-through gate or something like that that's a little bit more reliable. So you just have to stay tuned, see what we come up with. We'll go ahead and get the net wrap off of this bale first so that they can get started while we're doing the rest of this. The purpose of these legs here on the front of the trailer is just so that while the cows are pushing on the feed wagon that it's not, all of that force is not being transferred to the tongue jack. And with that being said, a lot of people ask me why do I leave the tongue jack on there? Because when I leave it on, the potential is there for the cows to fold that thing in half, bend it over. But the reason why it's on is because for one, with the jack fully collapsed, that is the strongest that it will be. But also, if while they're eating, as they continuously push back and forth on that trailer, these legs that I've got on the front have a tendency to sink a little bit. And what can happen is if you don't leave that jack on there, when you come to hook back up to it, you gotta get in here with a shovel and dig that out in order to get the jack to fit on. Is that a huge deal? No, but it's just one of those things that it's a little bit easier to do it this way. All right, these dogs need to run and we need to go check some hot wire, water, all the, all the things, so let's do it. Come on. After any sort of rainstorm, I always like to come and look at the pond and see what things look like. And I've ac I can actually notice that the water has come up several inches. Still a pretty long way from flood stage, but it's looking better. After the dogs run for a little while with the truck and they start getting tired, what they will start doing is running very close to the truck. And I don't like that 
because I feel like there's a potential for something bad to happen. So while I'm out here not on a county road, this is a great time to start teaching Belly about how to ride in the back of the truck. And this is made all that much better by having Callie with us who knows how to do it and knows not to jump out. I think Belly will probably just follow her lead, but we can keep a close eye on her while we're driving around out here. You're thinking about trying it. Huh? Get Riding your dog in the back of the truck is not the safest thing for them and I don't recommend anyone else do it. But when you live this sort of a lifestyle every once in a while, there is, there is a need for this. And like driving around out here is a perfect example. Before I would ever put Belly in the back of the truck while we're moving, the first thing to do is to teach her how to stay in the back of the truck when it's not moving. And we've already worked on that plenty. So I feel like she's gonna be fine back there this time. But of course, we wanna keep a close eye on her. That right there is exactly why you check your wire. We went from over 10,000 volts yesterday to 1,000, 1,200 volts today. Odds are there's something laying on that wire. It was a little bit windy last night, so hopefully just a branch or something stupid like that. But since I don't have my nice tester with me, um, we're just gonna have to walk this wire and see if we can find it. Which means you guys can come with me. That's probably a little bit far for you to jump. Well, I walked the wire and I cannot find anything touching it. So let me put the tester on again. Maybe I didn't have it um, grounding, you know, very well. Well, uh, well, let's just try it again. I don't know, something weird's going on. There's eight, nine. Eight, eight. Zero. I haven't seen the box do this before, but I wonder if just because we've had several consecutive days that have been cloudy, we haven't had good sunlight, if maybe it goes into a different mode to kind of preserve that battery and make it last a little bit longer. Because what I'm seeing it do is hit like 8,000 volts and then like 1,000 volt. And it just kind of alternates pretty steadily back and forth between the two. So for now, I'm gonna assume that's what's going on. Um, might have to get in touch with someone at Gallagher and see. I want to talk a little bit about efficiency. That's something that I often think about. How can I accomplish what I need to accomplish while using less time or resources? And while I'm thinking about that, I'll just come right out and tell you, I know that right now the way I'm feeding the steers up at the steer pasture is about the most inefficient way that I can do it. Those guys are getting two bales a week, which means twice a week, I need to load a bale into my truck drive the 25 miles to the steer pasture, unload the bale, put it in their feeder, drive the 25 miles back home. Each round trip to feed the steers takes me about two hours. So basically I'm looking at 100 miles and four hours a week that I have to dedicate to doing this. So how can I improve upon this? Well, I've got a couple of ideas, some that I could implement 
more or less right away and then some that would be more like things that I could do for next year. I think it would be to my advantage to, instead of take one bale each time I go out there, but to just load maybe 12 or 14 bales up on my trailer, take them up to the steer pasture and then stack them up somewhere out there. This way, I'm only taking my truck up there once and then I could take my commuter car or something that's a little bit more fuel efficient or cheaper to drive up there to feed on those other times during the week. That would save a lot of fuel, but not necessarily save me a lot of time as I would still be having to go up there twice a week. So to save time, the best thing that I can come up with is to get a second feeder up there so that instead of putting one bale out and then coming back in three or four days to put another bale out, I could just put two bales out for the week. And I am aware that if I put two bales out, say on Monday, that they might go through that entire quantity of hay faster than they would if I split that up. But I think that there's enough grass that carries over through the winter up there that it wouldn't be a problem. In other words, if they finish their hay up in four or five days, they could be fine for another two days on the grass. So that is kind of my plan for next year at least. I think at the beginning of feeding season, which should be somewhere mid to late December, I can just calculate because I know about how many months I'll have to feed and just take all the bales up there in one shot so that I won't have to take my truck each time that I need to feed. And then if I can get a second feeder set up, then I will only have to go up there once a week unless there's some other sort of problem that needs to be dealt with. So the question becomes, how do I go about getting a second feeder? Obviously I could go buy one. The problem with ring feeders is they are kind of pricey uh, unless you want to get ones that are very low quality, which I just, don't want to do. From what I've seen, the decent ring feeders are about a thousand dollars and up from there. Of course, I've got this third of a ring feeder sitting right here that doesn't really do me a lot of good and, you know, just by itself, unless I was to make another fence line feeder, which I may end up doing one day. But until that day comes, if it comes, this is kind of useless to me. So I could kind of copy this design or the, these dimensions at least and make two more pieces so that these would all pin together and make a complete ring again. But in order to do that, I would have to get new rolling dies for my tubing roller to make these big radius pieces. So that's gonna be an additional expense. Plus the steel itself is not cheap. It might honestly end up costing just as much or even a little bit more to make two more thirds to go with this one. Of course, I would have the tools forever after that point, but these are just kind of the things that I need to weigh. So this is probably not something that I'm gonna worry about this year because by the time I gathered up, the money or the resources to build one while well, I will, will probably be almost done feeding hay over there anyway. So I don't really see a lot of reason to get too excited about it for this year, but it's definitely an improvement that I wanna make for next year. If you're a dog, I guess that's a lot of fun. It, it doesn't look fun to me, but man, those two just never quit. Thanks for hanging out with me today, guys, and I hope I'll see you again on Farmer Tyler Ranch.